Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode. I'm Mike Monticello. I'm Ryan Pilikowski. I'm Joe Veselak. So today we're going to be talking all about the 2024 Ford Mustang. And these will be our first impressions of two different models that we rented from Ford. Uh, an EcoBoost with the turbo four-cylinder and a Dark Horse mm. with the monstrous V8. But just a little background on, on what's going on with the redesigned 2024 Mustang. This is the seventh generation because this car has been around since the mid '60s, right? So this is this uh, this uh, pony car has been around for a long time. Now it's got uh, new styling, a bit more power for the engines, and some more active safety features. So we're definitely happy to see that. The cabin has, I guess you could say, an evolutionary makeover, but it's actually it's gone from you know kind of more rounded, a rounded dials and things like that to you know the the current. Flat, sort of like flat screen across the dash mm. that everyone is going to. It will again be offered in both coupe and convertible form, as the Mustang has been doing for a long time. As I said, EcoBoost 2.3 liter turbocharged four cylinder is the base engine uh, for 2024, 315 horsepower, which is a five horsepower increase. Uh, so Joey, don't use that all at once. Okay, <laughs> I'll try not to. <laughs> and the GT has a five liter V8. Uh, power has gone from 460 horsepower now up to 480 mm. uh six speed manual or 10 speed automatic and then there's the dark horse model which is one of the cars we're going to be talking about today and the car we're really going to be focusing on today and that has a 500 horsepower v8 heavier duty six speed manual transmission uh from the mustang gt350 uh unique exterior styling has ford's magna ride adaptive suspension system brembo brakes uh, and the car we rented has the optional uh, Recaro sports seats, as does the EcoBoost has the optional Recaros as well. Now, a 10-speed automatic transmission is available on the Dark Horse, and that's what was fitted to the version that we rented from Ford. Mm. Kind of a bummer. Anyway, we'll, but we'll take what we can get. Um, so, as we said, these are our first impressions, and honestly, these will be our first and only impressions on both the EcoBoost and the Dark Horse because we're going to be buying a GT with a six-speed manual. Mm. I know you guys are happy to hear that for our auto test program, so stay tuned for that. In terms of active safety and driver assistance features, uh, the 2024 Mustang comes standard with forward collision warning, automatic emergency braking with pedestrian detection, automatic emergency braking that operates at highway speeds, blind spot warning, rear cross traffic warning, reverse automatic emergency braking, lane departure warning, and lane keeping assistance. Ooh. And uh, yeah, that's a lot of features. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and adaptive cruise control and lane centering assistance are optional. In terms of pricing, uh, 2024 Mustang EcoBoost starts at 30920 The GT starts at $42,495. And the Dark Horse starts at 59270 So that's quite a hefty sum mm -hmm. for that one. Uh, and keep in mind, those prices don't include the $1,595 destination fee that Ford charges on every single Mustang. So um, let's put a disclaimer in here right off the bat. And we're, our producer forces us to put this disclaimer on here, which is this is going to be a driving heavy podcast episode, right? And we're probably going to, you know, gearhead geek out a lot. So just be aware that that's going to happen. Am I right? Get, yeah, get ready. <laughs> get ready for it. <laughs> So, and Joey, I'm going to throw it to you first, because Mustangs are really all about the powertrain. And as people are going to be seeing, uh, you're in pretty much all the shots of this Mustang doing some really fun stuff. So let's talk about what it's like to drive a 500 horsepower Mustang, both on the road and the track. Yeah, so this car is a lot of fun. You have power everywhere throughout the power band, throughout the RPM range. So driving it on the road... It's actually really civilized. You can lug the engine and you're, you, no matter what gear you're in, you usually have enough torque and power to just, you know, pull through, drive through, passing situations. You barely have to roll into the throttle to, you know, get the power you need. It has tons of power. And then that's when on the track, it's, it's real fun. You know, you can use, actually use all that power that you don't really need on the road. I'm not right. saying I wouldn't take 500 horse on the road. <laughs> But um, I mean, if, I they, see if the, they give it to you, right? I want to see these clips. I mean, I can't wait to watch this. I, I never saw the the, the, the clips yet. Oh, the, the truth, I haven't seen Joe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, Ryan, same thing. I mean, did you yeah, enjoy driving it yeah, both on uh, the road and on the track? I did. I, I the, the I mean, we'll talk about. It, I guess the the automatic took a lot away. Let's talk I, about that now. Want to talk about it? Yeah. Right now? We'll go for it. Let's get into it. It's awful. 
Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, it's not, it's not awful. I, I, it's just, it took away from the car. Um, yeah, th- it has like 20 gears, I feel like, and I couldn't figure out what gear right. I was in. It has 10, but it feels like, 20. it feels like it has 20 gears right. and it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't feel like it needs 20 gears, t- 10 gears right. because it has so much freaking power. Um, but, um, I have an embarrassing story. Actually, I drove around the track and I haven't done this in years, but I spun the car out because I was coming into the tire, that tire building corner. The Ryan Pizlkowski. I spun out. I'm spun embarrassed out. to talk yeah, about you this. You hear it here first. Listen, <laughs> I was coming up to that corner yeah. and I downshifted. Right. With I the paddles, know, right? With the paddles. I don't yeah. know what gear I'm in because I, I would just, I'm watching where I'm going. I'm driving swiftly, right? First lap. And I downshift and it downshifted like three seconds later, <laughs> mid corner. While I was already sliding sideways, right. and I, just, I just spun out. Now, I, it was just so delayed is my point. Now you had... The electronics. Yeah, I'm, I, was around. I was horsing around. I was horsing around. around. Sure. Okay. But um, you just weren't expecting it to it react so away. You're blaming it almost 100% on the automatic, right? And the lazy way it operates. It was mostly that the automatics fault. Yeah. Okay. It was so delayed. I was like, this is, I couldn't believe that. It took, it took that long to downshift. And then when you, mid corner like that, you're sli- you know, you're sliding and then you downshift, you're locking up the rear wheels again a little more. Right. Um, guess what happens? I mean, you, you, you lose even more traction. Right? Yeah. It so, disrupts the balance yeah, of the just, car. Exactly, so you notice yeah. it comes on abruptly. I've had it, I had it happen to me in that. I do agree with everything you're saying about the automatic. It, yeah. it sometimes, especially if you're changing the mode between sport or just the normal, which <laughs> I would found that I was. I liked it in normal as well, but sport sometimes changed its characteristics depending on how you are driving it right. at that moment. And one time it'll hold the gear for you and you're good, right. so it won't do anything like he's describing, or right. it'll upshift and then you go to ask for power and all of a sudden- And this is right. when you have it like in, in just regular drive mode and right. it's doing the, the shifting for you. Correct? Exactly. Okay. I mean, I thought the upshifts are okay. I thought um, under a heavy load, that was a little quicker. Um, when I talk about quickness, I mean, the, the actual transmission's qu- shifting is quick, mm-hmm. but the, the time when you hit the paddle to the command, you know, it makes the, c- c- gives it the command to right. actually shift the gears, it, it takes too long. Um, and, and a car like this, like it should be, Porsche has a, the PDK, I don't, right. I, the acronym is, I don't even know what it stands for, some crazy it's German. It's dual word. clutch uh, transmission, yeah, but, but they it's a some, German Yeah, word. it's a yeah, German exactly, word. Either yeah. way, but that's instantaneous, right? It's like, it's, and it pops into gear so fast, it's instant. That's yeah, the man, be. you won't even use the paddles, or I wasn't using them or won't because of the big delay in them. Exactly. When you right. go to use them, yeah. you want them to be instant, and that's not the case here. Right, yeah. and you know, paddle shift automatics have been around for a long time. Sure. Yeah. And they've been blipping the throttle uh, on downshifts mm-hmm. for a long time. Yeah. And this one doesn't do great uh, blips. Mm-hmm. And you said it's, and like you said, it's delayed. It's delayed. And yeah. you, you're very easily going to, I wanted to use the paddles on the road because it's fun to use the paddles, yeah. especially yeah. in automatic. It's not that fun. So you make it a little more fun by, mm-hmm. you know, being bossy and doing it yourself. Yeah. And you do that downshift and you're coming up like, and it's like, you flip the paddle, nothing yeah. happens, and then it blips. It's almost like someone who's really bad at heel and toe downshifting, yeah. you know, or manual transmission, that they can't yeah. get that and throttle it, right. And then that thing sound is loud. I mean, right. you know, the, the loud exhaust motor right. is loud, so you can hear it. Right. So it accentuates it even more. Like if you're, you know, c- coming right. up to a stop sign or something, you want to hear it kind of downshifting. It just doesn't like jive. I don't right. know. I, I wish it was a manual. It probably would have been because yeah. yeah. dynamically, the, the, like the handling dynamics, I thought were fantastic. Did you like yeah. the balance, both both the handling to ride, especially out on the street, because that's where most people are going to drive these cars. It has adaptive suspension, so you can switch it between, you know, more console mode and uh, stiffer mode. What did you think of that, you know, the hand lane versus how well it rode or didn't? On yeah, the I think it's a really well-balanced ride to handling out, yeah. especially on the road. I like how it's soft. You can put it, soften up the suspension, have the exhaust nice and loud, the powertrain where you want it. I really enjoy driving it on the road. And then when you want to push it on the track, you can shift it in sport mode, stiffen it up, have it stiff when you want to be, and it performs well. Right. I had a hard time getting the suspension to do an adjust with the controls, like the settings. I wasn't able to successfully get in there, except for one time when I did the e-brake mode thing. We'll, we'll talk about that. Tell you what, let's talk about yeah. controls later. Okay. And we'll get back to that, because okay. I totally agree with you. Yeah, there was some I want to talk coming. about yeah. where I think you were going to go to, mm-hmm. which is this drift brake yes that this car has and i'm gonna go to you ryan because i you I definitely fiddled yeah. around with yeah. it uh i was forbidden by big john from fiddling around with oh. it oh i'm kidding i'm kidding no <laughs> uh but they remember they had said let's yeah. keep the the track handling stuff to a minimum so i, I mostly just stuck around on the yeah. road but you played around with this drift brake which mm-hmm. and now ford we already gave our disclaimer for this episode right ford gives a disclaimer for the drift brake that's on this dark horse which is Drift brake is intended for track use only. It should never be used on public roads. Correct. And you used it properly. Used it on the track. I did. I, so I was, what yeah. is it and how does it work and did you like it? Um, 
<laughs> well, it's a it's an e, it's the e brake we all wanted growing up, right? Um, it actually locks up the rear wheels um, with some authority. Um, so in a, in a drift car, if you watch drifting, they have a hydraulic brake that this locks giant the, yeah lever. that big yeah. stick that's thick yeah. enough for next to the shifter or whatever. Um, it locks the rear wheels up like it's like it's hydraulic. It locks them up with power, um, so you can kick the car sideways. Um, this is essentially that in a street car. But that e brake is also it's also it's also a normal emergency brake, where it, but it's like a switch. So like when you pull it up, it doesn't have a button. It doesn't like you don't hear it click and lock. It just pulls up. You pull it up if you're parked. You pull it up. It locks. Yeah. And then it goes back down. And then when you want to undo it, you push it down and it like unlocks. But if you put it in this e the uh, drift brake mode yeah. while you're driving, you just pull up on this thing. While, you know while you're driving. And I Mike Croston and I actually went out in this, this uh, VDA area and um, yanked it and it locks right up. I mean, it's kind of wild. So yeah. uh, it's kind of weird to me though, because a car with that much horsepower doesn't necessarily, like I can, you can easily get the car sideways without provoking it like that. So, so it's kind of unnecessary. I yeah, it's so. a low speed thing. I <laughs> yeah. think if you want to throw it sideways around a cone, like the gym kind of can block sure. stuff, okay. you see where yeah. you really want to have a more of a low speed maneuver without just putting, or you're coming in in a braking situation. I, that's what yeah. it's that's, good for. That's what you that need it, because yeah, and you want to upset it and rotate the car. I, right. Where if you start from a, if you're at a standstill, you can just put the pedal to the floor <laughs> and <laughs> spin the front end, right, or right, put right. the rear end right around the front, no problem. Right. I'm just curious how much trouble they're asking for, putting a, 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 something like that in a car that, yeah, it says to only use on the, the track, but um, yeah. people don't do the smartest things all the time, so. In Mustangs? In Mustangs. You've seen, you've seen <laughs> I don't videos, I know, a Mustang owner is not doing the smartest things. Um, well, hey, it, yeah. it is neat. It works well. Yeah. I thought it was yeah. kind of cool um, to play with, for sure. I've never, I haven't seen that in another car yet. I don't know if you have, Yeah, but. it's just something that's, you know, something new, a yeah. new different feature yeah. that right. we've seen in a racing world that can be brought into, you know, us on the but street. But don't shoot <laughs> on the street, it, right? only on yeah. the track. Correct. Uh, okay, so let's move inside the car, and I don't know which one of you has stronger feelings about it, but let's talk about the new, you know, it has a new driver screen and a new infotainment system. Uh, I didn't love it. Joey, what did you think of it? I, yeah, I like just a traditional gauge cluster, especially in a retro muscle car. You want to see, you know, True, the pan analog you know, gauges, not yeah, digital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or even, even if it's digital, that's fine, but still have like an analog um, shroud or uh, what am I looking to say? The, uh, yeah, you know, a shape dash. You don't want a flat yeah, panel cow. going across That's what I'm looking it. to say. Yeah, you want yeah. a normal cowl rather than it's, you know, you're just seeing more of this EV, the tech stuff that you're seeing in a lot of the EVs yeah. being... Right you know, put into cars like these now. And you found the infotainment system difficult because you couldn't even, it was difficult. It has this adaptive suspension, has this multi-mode exhaust system, yeah, which yeah. is really cool. You can have the exhaust set to, to mm -hmm. quiet or loud or yep. maybe quiet, normal, and then obnoxious or sure, whatever. Sure, yeah. I personally love the obnoxious. It's not called that, folks, but it does get it, pretty it, loud. It's, it's loud. But it's hard to find any of these things, right? Yeah, well, there's a hard button down below, like a little Mustang thing that, that you push, and that brings up that all that, those menus or whatever. Um, and the exhaust button's, like, right there. Um, but, like, to adjust the steering wheel, there's a button on the steering wheel for the, the t you know, tightens the steering up a little bit in the sport mode, um, and then, like, a track mode. Um, but the screen is so delayed. Like, yeah. I... I was I go to the gym pretty early in the morning, so and I got up. I knew that that car had a cold start loud, so yeah. I got I get up at like five thirty to go to the gym, and I turn the car the accessories on because it defaults to like a normal exhaust mode, it's loud. Right. So I turn the accessory on to get the screen to come up, so I could switch it to the quiet mode before I actually started it. So I don't wake the whole neighborhood up. Um, but it, it took like two minutes for the screen. I, and this is maybe an early production car; they're having right. they haven't ironed it out fully yet, but. Um, I was shocked how long it took just to get these screens to come up. Yeah, Ryan, I totally understand your kind of confusion or whatever about the infotainment system mm -hmm. and not things aren't easy to access. Like I wish there was an actual button just purely for drive modes on the center console. Like you right. press it so and you get it around either yeah. a dial or a right. button. You press it and, and it keeps changing within the modes. Yeah. You have to hit this uh, this um, little Mustang horsey button on the center on the um center stack mm. and then that brings up this custom mode within the um infotainment screen and then it's from within there that you you then choose your different parameters and so honestly once i figured that out i just left that screen up on the infotainment screen oh, yeah, that the was whole time so yeah. then I, if, oh, I want to go softer on the suspension or i want to go louder on the exhaust i want to try you know this mode mm. so that's what i did but uh, it's definitely not perfect. And then what really bothered me, though, was this switch to, and this is not unique to this Ford Mustang. Lots of cars are doing this. You know, it now has 
all the climate controls, basically they're all within the touchscreen mm -hmm. other than I think it's max to frost is the only true physical button. And then the only things you can do quickly with the touchscreen are to adjust the temperature and turning on or off the steering wheel heat. If you want to change the fan speed, you have to first uh, hit the, the an icon on the screen and that brings up that menu and then you have to pinpoint these tiny little dots like if you want to increase the you have to go while you're trying to drive <laughs> you know to yeah. change the change the, say from you know a three to a four for fan speed um and same thing with airflow mode it's just not easy but yeah. so that's not the best but we mentioned the recaro seats this recaro sport seats uh that are optional on the dark horse you'd mm -hmm. think they'd be standard but i could see why they maybe they're not because when a seat is this heavily bolstered it's not going to fit every every body no, it's why all, force right. people yeah how did it work for you guys joey let's start with you yeah it fits me actually perfectly um the only thing i don't like is getting in and out, getting in and out but that's something you just have to deal with because you like, have to get over yeah, the bolsters yeah, but that's sense, like that's, that's the nature of it yeah. exactly but um yeah. yeah they fit me good yeah they what fit, about you it fit me uh, pretty well it, it's snug though i mean i i could see um everyday life maybe getting a little frustrating you know getting in and out but um yeah. when you're, you're hot dogging down the track with it it's nice because you, you don't budge you know right. uh, and that's the point of it that's the point of the bolstering so i i love them and and the dark horse has um uh kind of suede inserts yeah. whereas the the eco boost uh turbo four we had also had the recarls but not with those suede inserts and the suede inserts just hold you in place even better and not only for me where the bolster is great but the seat i found it pretty comfortable i will say though if i was much wider i I, they would be too yeah. narrow for me. So it limits uh, how many people yeah. will fit in there. I think. Yeah. So did you, did you guys did you play with the gauge the clusters at all? The actual like you could change them to like no the old school the, like the Fox body like the it's like a old school analog gauges and they're like they're like green at night they light up like a green they're like green glow. So I thought that was wicked cool. Like it's kind of a vintage thing and I don't know I miss the old analog gauges um, gauge clusters in cars. I don't know. So yeah, it was, so you can really, have it if you want. It's, yeah, it's neat. Yeah. And there's like and there's like four or four or five different you know other screens you could put up there okay. yeah i didn't know that it. it was in that old school style the entire time i drove it i thought so it was cool it was so when i, I got it. in it and i was like that's cool and then i actually switched it away from it just to see because it has like the other ones with, like the bars that light up as it goes like the corvette had you know yeah. different that's too futuristic for me i like the analog gauges but i did too all i was focused on was the sound of that v8 because that oh, thing so sounds good. so good and i love that it it it's like you said joe it's got power down low and it loves revving all the way up to red line it yeah. sounds so good um and speaking of that and the wondrousness of V8s that have been around for a long time, you know, the industry is moving more toward electrification. Mm -hmm. um, and this seventh generation Mustang may be the last uh, Mustang or maybe the last muscle car with a V8. Uh, what you, do you guys think you about that, this? Ryan? What do you, <laughs> trying, you I'm saying, depressing why are you saying these things? I know. Um, what, what do you <laughs> think about that? If, what if this is the last, you know, this generation? It won't be 2024, but what if this generation is the last? V8 powered Mustang. What do you think about that? Um, well, I think that's sad. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, w I would hope that that's not the case. I mean, yeah, I, there's gonna be more electric cars, but why can't we have a couple of these guys hanging around? You know? Yeah, maybe um, they're bluffing. Maybe they're bluffing. Yeah, they get, yeah. I hope they are. Yeah. Yeah. It'd yeah, sad. we'll see. It'll be a sad day. If that's yeah. True. So I mean, as you know, one thing you could say is, well, you know, if you're if you're if you don't want to see these things go away, you know, speak with your wallet uh, and, or, or buy it and hang on to that thing <laughs> yeah. because if that is where we're heading. So uh, let's try to get more on a positive note, which is that we are going to buy a 2024 Mustang uh, GT with a six-speed manual for our auto test program. Uh, we have lots more information about the 2024 Mustang up on our website, consumerreports.org. So be sure you check that out and stay tuned for the road test results that we will have on the Mustang GT after it goes through our test program. So with that, let's move on to the audience questions segment of the podcast. And of course, don't forget to send those questions, comments, 30 second video clips at talkingcars at iCloud.com. And folks, we love those video questions. Uh, so please keep sending those in. And actually, we have one today from Jesse. So let's see what Jesse is asking us about. Hey, Talking Cars. Mazda's new naturally aspirated engines now include cylinder deactivation technology. Can you please comment on how they work and their reliability? Thanks. So Ryan, walk us through what exactly cylinder deactivation is, what its purpose is, how it works, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so uh, it's, well, it's kind of... Well, what the, the the title says, I mean, it's, they're literally deactivating um, some cylinders um, in in the engine while it's running, which is kind of wild because 
um, you know, the engine's a rotating assembly at all. It's all connected. And then each cylinder fires and, you know, we know how the engine works, but, um, like GM's been doing this for quite a while. The V8, you can take half of the, half of the motor and just stop, uh, putting fuel in the cylinders, close the valves and it saves fuel and, and emissions. And when you're cruising, coasting down the road, um, and you don't, you know, you're not going up a hill or you're just kind of coasting, you don't need all that horsepower that the vehicle, that motor might have at that time. I mean, when you drive around normally, you're not using all the horsepower the car has, right? Um, so let's reduce the fuel and the emissions by cu cutting half of that off, right? Um, so that's what they're, they, they've been doing this for a while. Um, and, you know, he's talking about this, the, the, the Mazda now. It's a four-cylinder. Like, right. V8 makes a little more sense to me because right. you, know, you still have four cylinders right. left, right? Now you're taking half of the, a four-cylinder, which is now two cylinders, um, and you're turning that off, um, to save fuel and stuff. Um, and there's a lot, I mean, there's m a lot of modern technology that's going into that that has perfected it. And GM used to have issues with, um, with some of the stuff, um, back in the day, but, um, and they've perfected it. Um, reliability wise, I don't know. Um, well, so I, I reached out to Steve Alec, uh, you know, who, uh, is our in-house data guy. He's been on the podcast, obviously you, you folks all know him. But he knows all about the reliability, the, the data that comes in from our annual auto survey. So I reached out to him and said, hey, uh, what have you been seeing with these, these Mazda engines uh, in the CX-5 and the Mazda 6? The 2.5 liter four cylinder started getting this uh, cylinder deactivation in 2018. So, uh, and he said, we have reliability data on uh, those cars through the 2022 model year. Actually, really you only need it through the 2021 model year for the Mazda 6, because that that's that was the last year of its production. Um, but he said through that time that uh, they've mostly been above average or, or uh, well above average. And he didn't, there weren't any comments specifically calling out issues with the cylinder deactivation system. So. The reality is these Mazdas, even with the cylinder deactivation, are still proving to be uh, quite reliable. So I, I don't think you have to worry about that. All right, so let's move on to another question. Uh, this one is from Imran, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Imran says, my daily work commute is 180 miles round trip, and I'm looking for a new car. I currently drive a 2014 Mazda CX-5 with 240,000 miles, which I love. It's a fun car to drive, but it's starting to knock and rattle and has some suspension issues. For my circumstance, do you think it's worthwhile to buy a new car as opposed to a used one? I've also been mainly looking at hybrids, uh, Toyota Camry and RAV4, but should I also look electric? I'm sure I would have to charge it every night, and I'm not sure if the battery degrades because of daily charging. Uh, Ryan, I'm going to start with you. What's your suggestion here? That's a heck of a commute every day. Yeah, it is. I could... I have some sympathy for that. Um, <laughs> if I was him, I would probably, if he, if he doesn't need the, uh, an SUV, I mean, the CX-5 is a nice little SUV. Um, I mean, you can't, if, I would go hybrid. I wouldn't go electric. Right. Um, I would go with a Toyota hybrid. <laughs> I mean, he's got it in there already, Toy Camry or RAV4. Um, they're both awesome cars. Toyota does the best um, hybrid system, I think, hands down. Um, Camry is going to be a little more comfortable, I think, but it's a car. RAV4 is um, SUV, a little bit more practical. So one of those is really the answer, if you ask. Yeah. He's already kind of named it for himself. Joey? Yeah, I completely ag agree with Ryan. Um, what I would say in terms of new or used, sounds like he's driving a lot of miles, which we see, I would, at least if you're getting used, you're going to want to get something with low mileage because it sounds like he's going to use the <laughs> this car up. <laughs> Yeah, I was yeah. I was kind of torn on the like, what do you tell this person? Because on the one hand, when you put that many miles on a car, it's kind of like, well, why waste the money on a new car, right? If you're going to yeah. end up putting that many miles before on before you even pay it off. But on that, the other yeah. hand, you if you're going to spend that much time in the car, you want to make sure it's a sure. car you really like. And if you buy a new, at least you you're very positive that it should be, you know, if you buy it, uh, it should be fine. Uh, I'm going to disagree a little bit, respectfully hmm. disagree, okay. and suggest that uh, Imran go with the uh, Honda CRV hybrid or the Honda Accord hybrid. And I'd lean really toward the CRV hybrid just because I think uh, they've been doing a little better. They're, 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 uh, the way that they work their hybrid system with simulated upshifts, it's just a little more pleasant um, than, than the Toyota RAV4 and the Toyota Camry. But I would say this, if you, the one caveat being that if you go with the Accord hybrid, don't get the base sport model like we did, which has 19 inch wheels, go one level up to the, the EXL hybrid because that has smaller 17 inch wheels, uh, which are, you know, 
gonna uh they have taller sidewalls for yep. the tires so the ride's likely going to be a little bit better and your fuel mileage is going to be a little bit better cheaper so, tires too exactly you know all about the tires <laughs> so uh anyway that's our uh that's going to do it for this episode if you want to learn more about the topics and uh, the cars that we talked about, you can click on the links in the show notes. Don't forget to send those questions, comments, 30-second video clips to talkingcars at iCloud.com. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you all next week.